1900, the devastation of the Civil War was distant enough so that its wounds were nearly healed. And there was great energy in the air, and an abiding belief that every tomorrow would be better than the day that had gone before. America's streets were not actually paved with gold, of course. But the bright promise to which they all led was as good as gold. We did not ourselves actually have to wave the flag. The brisk breeze of our optimism did that for us. There were somber notes, of course. In 1901, in Buffalo, New York, President William McKinley was assassinated. It would be his young vice president who would lead America into the 20th century. His young vice president was Theodore Roosevelt. Americanism is a matter of the spirit and of the soul, Teddy Roosevelt said. If he is loyal to this republic, any man, no matter where he was born, is just as good an American as anyone else. Teddy Roosevelt himself seemed a living summary of what an American should be. A straight-shooting outdoorsman, explorer, enemy of unbridled big business and of big government. He said so himself in 1908. The history of liberty was the history of the limitation of governmental power. It is true of the history of medieval Europe. It is not true of the history of 20th century America. Of course we had faith in the future, with Teddy Roosevelt pointing the way. What couldn't we do if we could dig the big ditch, the Panama Canal, to link the Atlantic and the Pacific? Teddy said, I took the isthmus, started the canal, and then left Congress to debate the canal as long as they wish. Where others had failed, stopped by mountains and vanquished by mosquitoes, we succeeded. You only needed to look at the man to know where America was headed. Forward, unstoppably forward. Millions had come to this country to put the conflicts of Europe behind them. Woodrow Wilson knew that, but there were continuous violations of America's neutrality. And when the Germans sank the British ocean liner Lusitania in 1915, killing many American passengers, among others, there seemed no longer to be any choice. We would enter the Great War, not in search of conquest, Wilson said, but to ensure universal right. Another who reminded this country of what was right was labor leader Samuel Gompers, Fellow Americans, our republic is at war against the imperial German and Austrian government. That fact all must now realize. War means victory for our cause or danger to the very existence of our nation. Later in 1928, another president, Herbert Hoover, remembered what it was like over there. I was one of the few civilians who saw something of the Battle of the Somme. In the distant view were the unending trenches filled with a million and a half of men. Here and there, like ants, they advanced under the thunder and the belching of volcanoes from 10,000 guns. Their lives were thrown away until half a million of them had died. Passing close by were the unending lines of men plodding along the right-hand side of the road to the front, not with drums and bands, but with saddened resignation. And down the left side of the road came the unending lines of wounded men, staggering among stretchers and ambulances. Do you think one can forget that? It was the unforgettable horror that spurred Wilson to try to end such conflicts forever. He sailed for Europe to sign a peace treaty and was welcomed as a hero in France. But he wanted more than just another treaty of peace. What he wanted was to create a league of nations to keep wars from happening. But Congress wanted no part of Wilson's dream. And besides, there never would be another world war. But back home, there was another victory still to be earned. At the turn of the century that made America great, most men, and many women too, believed that women had their place and that the fair sex should be sheltered from the rigors of life. Among the rigors from which women had to be sheltered was voting. During the First World War, however, America's women stepped out of their place. One in five went to work in munitions factories and oil refineries and in transportation. Oh, and yes, they did the nursing and the knitting 
and the gardening too. Having done all that, they demanded the right to vote right out in front of the White House. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified. Women had won the right to vote. And America had won something too, the full participation of half its people. Hard to understand how we could have done without it for so long. But now, the sky was the limit. <laughs>